Hello and welcome to this meeting of the Aaron and Her Missionaries. We are a group of people that have noticed that the signs of the times that Jesus referred to in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and all throughout the New Testament are happening in this generation. So we focused on them and the more we learned, the more we knew we needed to share. So we formed this ministry. We meet on Sunday nights, videotape it and put it out to the world. We appreciate your prayers. Appreciate all the emails and comments uh, that you've sent, and uh, um, we pray that you'll share this video with others. Now, we have been, um, let's see, we have been looking now at the truth concerning the ages. For you really have to understand what it is to say uh, there's one age that has been separated from another. This is commonly referred to as dispensations of time. And you need to know the truth about them. Uh, what is a dispensation of time? And did God do something different uh, with a different people during these different dispensations of time? And before we can really understand the season of the rapture and what takes place there, we need to understand what's went on in the past, what's going on now, uh, that points us in that direction. So we've entitled this series of messages, The Truth Concerning the Ages. And that brings us to this chart of the ages that we've put together. And I'm gonna to begin tonight to start familiarizing you uh, with it. If you'll notice here, I'm using the pointer on the mouse here. Um, can you all see that, Edward, back there? Yes. Um, a, we talked about last week. Now, we put it in alphabetical order to give you a chronological order of uh, the different dispensations of time. So when you see at the top of a bar, uh, the A, in this case, of course, it's the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to add many things below all these uh, as we learn in, uh, about the different uh, dispensations of time. But we put them in alphabetical order at the top so that it would denote the change of an age, the change of a dispensation of time. For an example, from Genesis and Adam and Eve and the fall of man, God began to deal uh, with Abraham to become a people. Abraham obeyed and become the father of all the Hebrew people. And God dealt with the Hebrew people, keeping his promises and uh, bringing about his plan for the redemption of mankind through the nation of Israel for 4,000 years. And then the Lord Jesus came, the promised Lamb of God, which moves us to a different time dispensation. And you'll see that we have been in it from B to C uh, for 2,000 years, which is now the church age. And then, uh, and the reason I'm showing you this now, because if you don't have, if you don't have the rapture here, uh, before uh, the uh, seven years of great tribulation, none of the rest of this makes sense. Uh, none, I think the rest of the Bible does not make sense if, if the rapture does not uh, happen pre-tribulation. And we're going to teach you why we believe this according to the Word of God, not the traditions of men. Amen? So, uh, then, so what we, where we're living right now is in this 2,000 years now, we've been living in what is known as the church age or the time of the church uh, when those that have believed in the resurrected Savior have repented of their sins and uh, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the family of God. Now the next dispensation of time will be under letter C when the rapture takes place, the Antichrist is revealed, the great tribulation going on here uh, on earth with the church being married, the bride of Christ being married in heaven. And at this time, God, who turned away from Israel, now he's not forsaken Israel or Israel would be gone. The devil wants them gone, but he has turned his attention or this dispensation of time to the church, the bride of Christ, to reach a lost and dying world. But during the time of the tribulation, he will turn back to Israel to prove to them and to show them that Jesus Christ indeed is their Messiah. You see, he has to be their Messiah before he could ever be their king. They wanted the king part of Jesus, but they could not see the Messiah part uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we go on through the millennial reign and what we'll be doing, and then the great white throne, and then 
the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as eternity begins. So we're going to work our way through this as time, uh, as time goes on and we're going to learn because we have to know these things before we can appreciate the season we're living in right now. Okay, so the truth concerning the ages. Dispensations of time now, when we talk about ages or dispensation of time, we're talking about a set time that God has predetermined before he ever made the world, this is when I'm going to do this. You see, man sinning in the garden was not a surprise to God, uh, just like the cross was not an ambulance headed to the scene of an accident. Oliver B. Green used to say that all the time. But God knew that man would sin and he had a plan because he knows the end from the beginning, you see. God's plan was for himself to become a man as his son and to die for the sins of the world. So when we talk about a dispensation of time or an age, we're talking about a set time that has a set beginning and a set ending according to God's plan and God's purpose. No matter what you see going on, uh, with the White House or, or with Russia or China or any of your neighbors crime in the street, God is still on the throne. Amen. And God is not surprised. And God has a plan and God has a purpose. And it's our job, it's our duty to ourselves and to God and to our family to find out what this purpose and plan is and get in on it. Amen? So when we talk about a dispensation of time, we're talking about how God deals with a particular people in a particular way during a particular time, okay? So when we look at the chart, I gave you an introduction to it tonight. We're going to talk about the truth concerning these different time dispensations between A and B and B and C and so forth as we talk about the time of the rapture, which will begin the next dispensation of time or the next age. What is the truth concerning God's plan? For the past age, what happened? What is the truth? What is the truth concerning God's plan for this present age? What's the truth about it? What, what is God's plan? What is happening right now according to God's plan and purpose? What is the truth concerning the future? What's God's plan concerning the future? What's going to happen? So we have to ask ourselves, who knows the truth? God knows the truth. And God has written down the truth in the word of God. For Jesus said, thy word is truth. John 17, 17. So we have to ask ourselves, do we have the true word of God? Do we have God's true words? Is what we call the Bible, the Holy Bible, really God's word or words to us? Well, I make a vow to you and to all of our people that are here that we're going to look at facts, facts that can be substantiated, that can be proved, and it will leave no doubt to a reasonable mind and no one will be able to prove anything that I'm saying to be wrong to you. Nobody can prove that because we're going to use facts that we know are true and can be proven to prove that we do have the Word of God. Because if you don't believe that we have the Word of God, if you don't believe that we have the Word of God, then how can you believe uh, that Jesus is coming? How can you believe anything uh, that the Bible says if you don't believe it to be true? Let me show you something that God says about his word and people. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, 24, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. Now, when the Bible talks or refers to someone as the natural man, he's talking about uh, when man is in his fallen nature. You see, when we are born into this world, we are born with a fallen nature. 
We don't have, we are born all together into sin. You don't have to be taught how to sin. We sin naturally. The Bible refers to the natural man as the fallen man or one having the fallen nature. It's someone that has not been regenerated or born again by the spirit of God coming to live in them. And he says that this natural man or in our natural state, we cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. So for you that have not been born again, that have not the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ living in you, the Bible says for you, the things of God are foolishness. Now that's not, that's not trying to um, uh, uh, make fun of you or anything like that. It's just saying you cannot understand the spirit of God because the spirit of God has not opened your eyes by coming to dwell in you. So therefore, the Bible will be foolishness to you, you see. So you owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself to listen what the Bible would say to you that are in your fallen nature. Here's the first thing the Bible says to someone that is still in their natural man. And that is that we have sinned and we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the first thing the Bible will say to a person. And if you reject God's remedy for sin, then God, there's nothing else that you can really understand about the word of God until you repent of your sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized by the Holy Spirit into the family of God. Otherwise, all this is just a bunch of foolishness. Think about that. Give that some time. He said, neither can you know them because they are spiritually discerned. So the truth is, my friends, the Bible is the Word of God. Now, let me start with you just a moment. The Bible is the Word of God. We're going to prove that. If you, you owe it to yourself to follow along with us the next few weeks, because we're going to prove it without a doubt that God has given us His Word and God has preserved His Word. And it don't matter if you understand it. Listen, because it's still God's Word. That's not going to make any difference with it being the Word of God. But if you don't understand it, it can't help you, you see. Unless you understand the word of God, it does you no good. So if the Bible is truly the word of God, and it is, why should we want to study it? Because we need to know what it says. If God has said something to us, and he's the one with whom we have to do, wouldn't it behoove us to know what it says? It would behoove us. It's the most important thing, my friends. God's word to you is the most important thing in this world, more important than anything else. So it would behoove you to listen to us on purpose over the next few weeks so that you can find out, do we have the word of God? And if we do, what does it say? Jesus said this about the word of God. Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You see, my friends, if indeed Jesus told the truth here, it is the word of God that will stand judgment over us on the day of judgment. So wouldn't it be imperative for me to know what the word is going to say? How can we be right with God if we do not know what his word requires of us? And on the judgment day, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter uh, concerning the truth of God if you believed it or not. It's still the truth. It's not going to, listen, if you understood it or you don't, the word of God is still going to judge us according to what Jesus said. So it's very important, very important that you get this settled in your heart. Now, I believe we have the word of God. So we have to ask ourselves these questions that will be answered because it's under attack today. The word of God is under attack from every angle today. And we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff. But do we have the word of God? Yes, we do. I'm going to prove it to you. Now, if I'm right, we have to ask ourselves these questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it complete? Do we have the complete word of God? Is it prophetic? In other words, has it prophesied of events before they happened and have they come true? 
Yes, many, many, many times. Many times, hundreds of times, just at the birth of Jesus Christ alone. You see, no other book, no other book dares to prophesy like the Word of God. Amen. So, is it prophetic? If, if, if prophecies in the Old Testament have come true, then my friends, we can rest assured that the prophecies that are in the future will as well come to pass. Then we're going to answer the question, does the Word of God ever change? <clears throat> Some people believe today that call themselves Christian that the Word of God changes with the culture. But I'd say to you, my friends, that God's Word never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, just like God is. So we're going to talk about that. Now, if somebody asked you, child of God, do you believe in the Word of God? And you say, yes then you need to tell them why you believe the Word of God. See, that's where we fall short in the church because we always want to say, well, let me go get the preacher or let me go get the Sunday school teacher. We need to be able to tell them why we believe. You need to know in your heart why you believe the Word of God. Or you may say, no, you don't believe the Word of God. Well, why do you believe that? You need to be able to answer these questions honestly to yourself. And when we think about this, we got to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, what does the Bible claim to be? And is it what it claims to be? The Bible claims to be the revelation of God. The Bible claims that uh, God is revealed within its pages between Genesis and the Revelation, that God is unveiled and that his will is, and his character is revealed to mankind. The Word of God claims to be the truth about God. The Word of God claims to be the truth about man, the fall of man, the way of salvation, and God's plan and purpose for the ages. Now listen, in order for the Bible to be God's Word and for us to find the truth of the ages, then it has to be infallible. The Word of God has, in order to be His Word and to be everything that God's Word claims to be, it must be true. It must be accurate in every way without error and without mistakes. Understand that the Bible teach of four, teaches of four main persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and Satan. It teaches of three places where people exist, heaven, hell, and earth. The Bible teaches of three classes of people, the Hebrew people, the Gentile people, and the church, which is both Hebrews and Gentiles that have been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the three classes of people that the Bible recognizes or that there is in creation. The Bible is, and we're going to prove this, if you listen now, the Bible is infallible because it is inspired of God, therefore it is inherent. You see, it is without mistake. And we're going to prove without a doubt that the Bible is indeed inspired, infallible, inherent, and we do have the, the Word of God in the Bible. Now when we say inspired, means that it was created from a divine impulse, from a divine impulse that is so um, outstanding and brilliant to a degree, it is past human ability. And we're going to prove that, that it is inspired. It is infallible, means that it is without mistake, it is incapable. The Word of God is incapable of making a mistake or of being wrong in any way. The Word of God is inherent. It is truth that never changes and is always true as it contains the holy character of God. Only God could write such a book. And my friends, the Word of God claims that it is alive. And once you become a child of God, you will learn that the Word of God indeed is alive. Amen? Now, the first thing you need to understand as we start proving with facts 
that we do have the word of God and that it is inspired and that it is infallible and that it is inherent. The first thing you need to understand is that the Bible came to us in pieces. Uh, it came to us in piecemeal, you might say. And it came to us at different times. <clears throat> Man, would you get me a, a, some water out of the refrigerator over there, please? Look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. <clears throat> The Bible says that God, that's where it all started. The word of God had to start with God, right? If it is the word of God. God who at sundry times and in divers manners. And what he's saying there, in sundry times, it means at different times, not all at once, but in different times and in different manners, in different ways, God spake in time passing to the fathers by the prophets, okay? So then he says, now that's, uh, of course, talking to the Hebrew people about the Old Testament prophets. But then in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, for the prophecy, speaking of the word of God, came not in old time by the will of man. Take man all the way out of uh, what the words that are on the pages, you see. Now, God might have used man as a vehicle, but it did not come by the will of man. In other words, man did not sit down and think up in their own minds with their, their own power of intellect the Word of God and write it down. It's excluded. It's excluded from the Word of God. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, God the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of the man's heart, grabbed a hold of the man's mind, grabbed a hold of the man's hand, and directed his hand what to write. Fallible man was taken all the way out of the program. Now this is a claim that the Bible makes. Can it be proven? Well, let me give you an example of what we're saying here. The Bible was written over a 1,600-year period. 1,600 years from B.C. 1492 to A.D. 100. The Bible consists of 66 different books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Now, these books were written by 40 different authors. 40 different men at different times, different cultures, different places, different people, in different manners or in different ways, the Bible was written by 40 different authors. And their class or their place in society and in the world was all different. Listen to this. It was written by kings <clears throat> such as David and Solomon. It was written by statesmen such as Daniel and Nehemiah, by a priest such as Ezra, by men learned in the wisdom of Egypt such as Moses, by men learned in Jewish law such as Paul, by herdsmen like Amos, by a tax gatherer named Matthew, by fishermen Peter, James, and John who were unlearned and ignorant men concerning the things of God a physician named Luke, and such mighty seers or prophet as Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. It is not a book about Asia, although it was written in that part of the world. It was also written in the wilderness of Sinai, in the cliffs of Arabia, the hills and towns of Palestine, the courts of the temple, the schools of the prophets at Bethel and Jericho, in the palace of Shushan, in Persia, on the banks of the river Shabar in Babylon, in the dungeons of Rome, and on the lonely island of Patmos and in the Aegean Sea. It would be absolutely impossible for man, absolutely impossible for man to do that on their own. Spread out over 1,600 years, 40 different authors, all from different places at different times, to write a book where everything agrees and everything is in harmony and everything comes together, both in the past and in the present and in the future. Only divinity could write that. 
Only divinity could preserve that. If you look at it honestly, just in these facts alone, and we have many more to give you, but only in these facts alone, it is an impossibility that man wrote the Word of God. Only God could have done it the way that it was written. And that's the way God works, so you'll know. Let me just give you an example for you to ponder. Hello, Michael. <clears throat> imagine, imagine a play that was written in the same manner, just a play. 66 different books written for one play, written by 40 different authors or 40 different playwrights over a period of 1,600 years, 40 different writers. And out of these 40 different writers, they all come from various backgrounds, various schools of thought, various languages, various cultures, various different times, and they're spread out all over the world, and they're not talking to one another, and they're not uh, collating together, and they're not getting together to collaborate on it. You see, there's no internet. And then after 1,600 years, you bring the writings of all these different 40 authors together to make the play. What kind of a play do you think you'd have? Total chaos. You see, with a play like the Bible, you have to have a plot, you have to have a theme, you have to have a beginning, you have to have an ending, you have to have a central character or characters. It would be impossible for man to just write a play like this, much less the Holy Word of God that is inherent, it's infallible, huh? it's inspired by God, you see. Yeah. Without mistake, the Bible has to be divine. Now listen, the Bible is written in a progressive way. There is a progression of revelation and doctrine in the Word of God. Now what I mean by this is that, for example, the judges knew more than the patriarchs knew. Okay? And the prophets knew more than the judges knew. And the apostles know more than the prophets knew. You see what I'm saying? It was progressive in its revelation as it is revealed to us God's plan and God's purpose. The old writings do not dispute in any way the new writings. And the New Testament in no way disputes or does away with the old writings. The Old Testament and the New Testament are not two separate books but two halves of a whole. The new is explained with the old, and the old is explained with the new. You cannot understand Leviticus if you don't understand Hebrews, and you cannot understand Daniel without revelation. You can't understand the Passover or Isaiah 53 without understanding Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see. Now, the language of the Bible is four kinds. Figurative, symbolic, literal, and parabolic. The parabolic method. Phrases like harden your heart, or harden not your heart, or let the dead bury the dead, these are figurative. Their meaning, their meaning is made clear in the context, okay? Then you have symbolic language. When you, for an example, when you think of Nebuchadnezzar's, uh, when he had the dream of this Colossus uh, image, that is symbolic language. Daniel's four wild beasts, symbolic. Jesus in the midst of the seven candlesticks, symbolic. And all this symbolism is explained most of the time in that very chapter with which it is presented, but when it's not, it is explained somewhere else in the Word of God. <clears throat> Be careful of anybody's private interpretation of the Word of God, for the Amen. Bible says clearly there is no private interpretation. Amen. And then there is the literal interpretation. Now this is called for for the rest of the Bible. And it, that means that it is interpreted to the customary rules of grammar and rhetoric. In other words, that, that, that is in society, 
it is the Bible is to be read in this regard, uh, just like you'd read any other book. And I, I had a professor tell me this one time in Bible college, and I found it to be very true. Whenever you can take the Bible literally, take the Bible literally. Don't try to make it say something that it don't say. Let the Bible just say what it wants to say. But you know what we try to do? We try to take all the traditions of men that we were raised in and try to make the Bible fit into that. We'd be much better off if we just let the Bible be true and every man a liar, amen? Just let the Bible say what it wants to say, amen? Now, then there is the parabolic method in imp of imparting truth. Jesus used this method a lot to teach the disciples. In the New Testament, it is used as a mystery method of imparting truth. Let me show you this. He said, And the disciples came and said unto him, we're in Matthew 13, verse 10, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you're a child of God... God's speaking to you there just like he was to the disciples. When the Spirit of God is living in you, then you, it is given to us, and we ought to praise God all night long over this, it is given to us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it is not given. Because like we talked about earlier, like we talked about earlier, to understand spiritual things, you have to have the Spirit of God living in you. And I'm going to show you why in just a minute. But he's telling the disciples here, it don't matter if they're religious, it don't matter their background, if the Spirit of God is not living in them, they're not going to understand the things of God. But it is given to us to understand. That ought to put you on shouting ground there tonight. Now, verse 12 and 13, that same chapter, Matthew, uh, Matthew 13, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. You see, if you don't understand something and, and your mind is blind to the things of God, even the little things that you can see and understand, you'll lose because they'll be taken over by man's thoughts and man's opinions, you see. And then he says in verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. When I see that verse right there, I think about the people I see on the news and different things and the things people get upset about and the things people say and the things people demand and the cursings people put on other people. And I realize that they... I don't get angry with them the way I used to when I was a young Christian because I realize they say this out of their ignorance for they know not God, you see. They don't know the things of God. They don't have the heart of God. They can't see the things of God. All they can see is the things of man. So instead of getting angry with them, my friends, and returning some of that rhetoric, what we ought to turn, return to them is mercy and love because we can see and they can't. You see, you see, you see. Then he says in verse 14 and 15, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their hearts and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. You see, that's where it starts with, with the fallen man is to hear, to repent, and to believe on Jesus Christ and be converted by the Holy Spirit, you see. And God would heal us of, it will heal us of not being able to see and not being able to hear. Before I got saved, I've shared this with you once before, before I got saved, I tried over and over again to pick up the Word of God and read it, but I could not stay with it because I could not understand any of it. The day I got saved, I came home and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all of a sudden my eyes were open and I could understand a lot of it because it had just happened to me, you see. So the Lord speaks to the disciples in parables here, and, uh, um, and people cannot understand them. He says, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. 
For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to, to see those things which you see and have not seen them, <clears throat> and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. And my friends, when, when I read that verse right there, it causes me to tremble. Because in our study, we have learned that we are the generation that is living in the season of the Lord's return. The prophets of the Old Testament could not see the church age. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced that, that even though they were shown the Messiah, and they were shown the cross, in particular Isaiah, they still could not see the church age. All they could see was the Hebrew people and their relationship with God. Now we on this side of the cross, we have seen God's plan and God's purpose more fully. We know more than they knew. And to whom much is given, much is expected. So that's why I've dedicated my life. I mean, I'm probably the dumbest guy that's ever stepped behind the pulpit. I'm probably the most enlightened preacher that's ever been called. But I want to use what God has given me for every, with every ounce of my being to, law, to warn a lost and a dying world, to warn the church that Jesus is even at the door, my friend. And, and listen, we can understand. And this is the Lord telling us, you can understand. You are the ones that can understand. The world cannot understand. Don't be leaving it to the government to warn people, the school, or even anybody at church. We've got to learn as individuals, you see, what the Word of God says about this so that we can share it. Because we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the heart to understand. Amen? Amen? You see, when he talks about a mystery, when he talks about a mystery, a mystery is not something that cannot be known. A mystery is something that has been hidden. Like a sealed letter or, or like a, a letter that comes in a foreign language. Once you learn that language, then you can understand the letter. And then the mystery ceases ceases when you learn the language and when we learn the mysteries of the bible it will help guide us and the way we learn is by the holy spirit teaching us look what he says concerning us and the word of god how be it when he the person of the spirit of truth god the holy spirit has come he will guide you into all truth Amen. and my friends listen to me the Holy Spirit, who wrote the Word of God. Remember we learned that a while ago? He moved on man. He's never going to go against the Word of God. Amen. He's never going to tell you anything outside the will of God. And you be very careful of these people that say they are prophets and they prophesy over you and then it don't happen. Because in the Old Testament, if a person missed one prophecy, they were labeled a false prophet and were to be stoned to death. God's prophets never miss. You be very careful telling somebody that God told you something when it's not in the Word of God. I ain't saying that He can't, but you be very careful with that and make sure it ain't you because if it don't come true, then it ain't God that told you that. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen. So He said He's going to introduce you into all truth. So I ask you, my friends, <coughs> Sorry, I have a scratchy throat. My wife gave me a cold about a week ago and I'm having trouble shaking it. Everything goes wrong, it's her fault, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Uh, where was I? The Holy Spirit is going to lead us into all truth. Yeah. Do you want to live your life in truth or in a lie? You see, it's my job to persuade you. It's, it's all of your jobs that are Christians to persuade people of what the truth is. And then they have to choose whether they want to live according to the truth or according to a lie. And once we know the truth, then it's no longer a mystery, right? So we've got to consider, do we have 
the true word of God. Now listen, friends, we've just scraped the surface today in proving to you with facts that we indeed have the word of God. We gave you enough truth tonight and enough evidence to prove that we do have the word of God. But we're going to give you insurmountable evidence that we do have the word of God. Because without you believing the word of God, you're not going to believe anything that we have to say from the word of God concerning the season that we're living in and the truth concerning the ages. So as we move along, we're going to answer these questions. What is the work of the Holy Spirit in this present age? Is he imparting new revelation concerning God and his plan and purpose for the age? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to people apart from the revelation already given to us and preserved in the Bible? Is God's plan and purpose for the ages already set and revealed in the Bible? So please plan on being with us next week and pray for us. I want to leave you with this, my email address. Some of you have been uh, dropping me a note here and there. Even if you don't agree with me, go ahead and send it to me and let's begin a dialogue and I'll show you why I believe what I believe and you tell me what you believe and why you believe it. We'll see if either one of us is relying on man's opinion or if we're both relying on what God has said. But feel free to email me there. And then here's our address. And I've said to you many times that we don't ask for money and we don't. But people have been sending money and uh, we're going to use this for God's glory. Uh, just to let you know what we're doing right now. We're going to hear uh, from a good friend of mine next week that is connected with some folks in Africa and with some of the refugees that have come here. And we have been uh, meeting on Saturdays and, and some of these uh, wonderful men have been translating these lessons into French, uh, the, the language, the main language there in the Congo, the Congolese. And uh, they received the first message last week and we're going to hear about the response with it and what all is going forth with that. So we want you to know that we are working hard every day and uh, we're trying to do what we can do uh, to share the news that Jesus is coming soon. God bless you, beloved. Now listen, if you've never received Jesus as your Savior and you want to know what's going on in this world, today is the day of salvation. Amen. Just bow your head, bend your knees before the Lord God Almighty. Confess yourself in truth, a sinner, for we all have sinned. Believe, profess the Lord Jesus Christ, for as the Holy Spirit has gave you witness and testimony that indeed he has risen from the dead. Believe on him and trust him, my friends. Follow him in baptism and may the Holy Spirit baptize you into the family of God. Your eyes will be opened, your ears will be unstopped, and your heart will be made to believe. Praise God. Praise God, my friends. There's no hope apart from salvation in Jesus Christ. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord God, in Jesus' name, we pray that you bless the reading now and the preaching and the deliverance of your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Could you get the camera there, hon, so I don't leave the screen blank? Bye-bye, everybody. See you soon.